Hi, welcome to the Pre-Calc Notes section. Well, we got 3.1 out of the Stitzeger book or 2.2 out of the larsen Hostetler book. Graphs of polynomial functions of higher order. So we want to look at some general shapes here. So what I'm going to do, you're going to be pretty active here and you're going to have to go ahead with your calculator and go ahead and graph some of these things and see how they look. So why don't you go ahead and do that. Do number one and number two, pause this, and we'll come back and summarize. Okay, I have my beautiful graphs here. And if you look at the color coding, uh, what I did was x to the 6 is here. Now, if you look at this for big X, uh, I, I should say, well, you don't really see for big X, but the x to the 6 rises quite steeply once you get further and further out for x. So this is going to be the greatest function way out there. What around 0? Which one is the greatest function? Well, it's amazing to some of you that x squared would be greater than x to the 6 in and around 0. But if you think about it a little bit, if I take 1 half and I square it, or 1 half and I raise it to the 6, well, the 1 half raised to the 6 is a much smaller number than 1 half raised to the second. So yes, this x to the 6 drops down below here, but for big X, it will grow much faster. So looking at these shapes, all of these are even degree polynomials. And so if we look at this, both have n behavior to the left and to the right that go to pause infinity. So what we write then is as x goes to infinity, so as we go out here for the x, what does my y do? Well, your y is going to go to positive infinity up here. Same thing here as x goes to negative infinity. So here's my x is going to negative infinity. What, is my, what do my y's do? f of x also goes to positive infinity. This is what we call n behavior. So make sure you get that down and we look at that. Now, for number two, how does this differ? Well, I, I hope you realize this. These are all odd degree polynomials. And with odd degree polynomials, it's a similar type situation. The higher de the degree for big X, it's going to be greater than the lower degree polynomials. But in and around zero, my picture's not perfect here, sorry. But in and around zero, X to the seventh is going to be less than X to the third. How is my end behavior? As X goes to infinity, F of X goes to pause infinity. So as we go out here on the X, what do my y's do? They go to positive infinity. What about as x goes to negative infinity, however? As x goes to negative infinity, f of x is going to go down to negative infinity. All right, so there's a little bit different behavior between these two. And I grouped them appropriately. I think you should know most of this stuff, but it's nice to summarize what we're doing there. Okay, then the next thing is, is that we want to generalize. So you might want to write a little bit about that, but we've already talked about some of that here. If it's even degree polynomial, both of the stems are going to go up together or they're going to go down together if we have a negative leading coefficient. If it's odd degree polynomial, one will go, well, if I'm reading left to right, it will be strictly increasing or strictly decreasing unless if I get some bubbles in the middle. We'll talk about that later. Okay, what is the degree of a polynomial? It's the highest degree term. So even if it's not written in descending order, my highest degree term here, I don't know if you can see that with the window here, my highest degree uh, term is the fifth degree. So this would be degree five. So let me write this if I have a polynomial f of x is equal to so if I have a polynomial, f of x is equal to ax to the n plus bx to the n minus 1 plus da 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 et cetera, plus some constant c. This is in descending order now. The previous example I had was not in descending order, so you take the highest degree polynomial. But since this is in descending order, then n is the degree of the polynomial. a is the leading coefficient. ax to the n is the leading term. And then we also need C. C is the constant. So we need all those items. All right? Now, for number three, I want you to generalize what happens when our leading coefficient of different polynomials is either positive or negative. So go ahead, take your graphing calculator and draw a quick axis here and a general shape because we want to try to figure out what the end behavior is. So these don't have to be perfect. 
but go ahead and graph those. Pause this and then I'll come back to you with the pictures and we'll talk more about it. Okay, so here are my pictures. This one's a cubic. It has the general shape of a cubic. It has a little dipsy do in the middle, but when we look at the end behavior, end behavior as x goes to infinity, what does the y do? Well, the f of x or the y goes to positive infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, what does the y do? Well, the y goes to negative infinity. This is kind of a classic cubic shape. Then for part b, it's x to the fifth. Oh, pretty much the same. Has a little extra dipsy do in there, but it's pretty much the same. Then if I do a negative to x to the fifth, this is the leading coefficient, so the degree is five. Look what happens to my end behavior. As x goes to negative infinity, what do my y's do? Well, my y's go to positive infinity. So in other words, my structure flipped around relative to when I had a leading coefficient that was positive. So you gotta look at this behavior and this all changed. Once again, leading coefficient negative, switched around. So degree odd, we get this general shape where one, goes, one side goes to positive infinity, the other one goes to negative infinity. The negative leading coefficient will tell you which way it is, okay? And then for even degree polynomials, if it's positive leading coefficient, then we're gonna have both sides going to positive infinity. As x goes to positive infinity, y goes to positive infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, y goes to positive infinity. Leading coefficient positive, same kind of shape. Dipsy do is in there though. And then for g, what's true about this leading coefficient now? Yes, it's negative. So my end behavior, everything is going down on both sides. So then my end behavior means that as x goes to negative infinity, I go to negative infinity. As x goes to positive infinity, my y values go to positive infinity. Okay, this isn't written out very well here, so I have to rewrite it. Hang on, pause, and we'll get there. So first of all, if n is odd, this is the general shape if a is positive. Inside here in the middle, I don't know, but I'm just telling about the ends. So as x goes to positive infinity, f of x will also go to positive infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, f of x will go to, it's going down, so it's negative infinity. All right, my things are disappearing, so I'm going to write some more of these out and come back to you. So for n odd, a is negative, x goes to positive infinity, f of x goes to negative infinity. So as I'm going to the right here, I'm going to go down. I put the dot, dot, dot in there because we don't know what goes on in the middle, but we are talking about n behavior. What happens at the end of all this, left and right? x goes to negative infinity, then we go f of x goes to positive infinity. I drew these pictures here for this one, n is even, we don't know what the behavior is in the middle, but the end behavior definitely is this. Why don't you go summarize that, pause this, and I'll come back. So there we go, I think you can understand this, if not, ask questions in your class. Let's look at, uh, I got a little tutorial, or I'm sorry, a little picture set up on the calculator here, let's look at that. So here's the general form of a cubic right here. So with the general form of the cubic, what I did was I put a leading coefficient of a. And with this slider here, I can change the values of a. So right now I have a being negative one. And then if I go through here, this is a translation of hk to a vertex of hk. So if I look at this slider, watch what happens with a being negative. Well, a being negative, this is an odd degree polynomial, x cubed we're going to have this type of behavior where we're strictly decreasing. Now when I say strictly decreasing, some of these, the behavior goes up and down in the middle here, but the end behavior comes from negative infinity and then goes to positive infinity, disregarding what happens in the middle, okay? Now watch, watch what happens as this changes. I'll get x equal to zero, which is trivial. It's not a polynomial anymore, but then x equal to one. Now look at my end behavior. As x goes to negative infinity, y's go to negative infinity. As x goes to positive infinity, y goes to positive infinity. So this little slider thing is kind of nice. Ooh, ooh. You can flick back and forth. 
and figure out what those values are. You can set up these sliders too. I'll try to make a video of this, but I can slide this back and forth for different values of H. What happens when I change K? Oh, yep, moves up and down. So our behavior still stays the same, or our end behavior still stays the same. We're just shifting and translating it. If I do the same thing with a fourth degree polynomial, I'll have this picture here. Now watch what happens when my A becomes negative. Ooh, that's trivial. Then we go A negative, both sides going down. We slide. Could do this all day. All right, that's pretty fun. Back to the graph, or back to the note. Okay, let's talk about the zeros of a polynomial. Zero, graphically, is where the graph crosses the x-axis. And so a polynomial with degree n means that the function has at most n real zeros. And also the graph has at most n minus 1 turning points. So let's look at a graph and see what this means. Here is a, a fourth degree polynomial here. And what we want to do with this is shift it a little bit. So I put a plus c at the end. Now if you look at this, this is a fourth degree polynomial. How many turning points do we have? Boop, there's one, boop, two, Oop, three, so three turning points. Fourth degree polynomial, three turning points. That's kind of what has to happen if your end behavior is going to go to positive infinity and negative infinity with the fourth degree polynomial. If it was sixth degree, I might have an extra couple bumps in here, but my end behavior is both going to go to positive infinity. So if I look at this, let's see how many zeros we can get here. Well, if I start up here, how many zeros do I have right now? Correct, none. Then if I go there, how many zeros does that look like it has? That looks like it has one, which we call a double root because it bounced off the x-axis. I'm not sure that it's double or not, or if that's my imagination, but that's what it looks like. So I can get zero zeros. I can get one zero. Now how many do I have? Two. So I can get two zeros. Then if I go right Oh, that was supposed to just touch there. I could maybe get three if that's just going to touch there. And if I keep on going, I could get four zeros. So my possibilities are that I get four, three, two, one, zero, zeros with a fourth degree polynomial. All right, so going back to the sheet, what does it say for us? It says that a polynomial with degree n means the function has at most n real zeros. That was just shown a little bit graphically. That doesn't prove it, but that's what's happening. And then the graph has at most n minus 1 turning points. Okay, what happens with a, uh, an even degree polynomial? I'm sorry, an odd degree polynomial. So this is even. We can get, remember, we can get zero, zero zeros if we want with the even degree polynomial. What if I change this a little bit and just make it a cubic? How many zeros can I get with a cubic? Well, there's one. And then I can get, that looks like two with one being a double root. And then I get three, three roots total. That's maximum. But if you notice, can I get zero? Can I have zero zeros? With the cubic, nope. Because it's always going to cross the x-axis someplace because your end behavior is going opposite directions. So with odd degree polynomials, it will always have at least one real zero. Even degree polynomials, maybe, maybe not. Okay, the next item, real zeros of a polynomial function. If f is a polynomial function and a is a real number, this is a different a than I was using just in the graphs. This is the zero, actually. Fi the following statements are equivalent. x equal to a is a zero of the function. That means that we cross the x-axis. x equal to a is the solution to the polynomial f of x is equal to zero. x minus a is a factor of the polynomial f of x. Remember, if we have x, x equal to a is a solution, x minus a is a factor. a zero is an x-intercept of the graph, and then f of c, oh, that should have been a, f of a equals zero. Okay, then we also have something that's repeated zeros. I talked about bouncing. And when we bounce off, we have something that's called multiplicity. And the multiplicity means that if I have repeated factors raised to a power, what's going to happen with that is that we get multiple zeros. And so if k is odd, the graph goes through the x-axis. If k is even, the graph bounces off the x-axis. So here's an example where k is even. 
If k is even, we're going to bounce off the x-axis, and so you're going to have maybe a double root or a quadruple root or so on. Here, what happens is that here we're going to have a, a multiplicity 2 where k is odd. Now, it might be k to the first power. If it's k to the first power, it usually just goes right through. But if it's uh, third power, fifth power, so on, what this does is it, when it gets around the x-axis, it really flattens off there just because of the factor there. So when we get this zero, it will really flatten off, and then we'll go on and do its other stuff. And so this would be multiplicity of, and, and maybe I should even go flatter to accentuate it. Then I went off. But uh, if it gets flat like that, then k is odd. Okay, now our last few examples, we want to try to graph these without a calculator. Okay, now if I look at this something like this, what do I have in common? I have x to the third in common. So y is equal to x third. 5x I have left minus 12. So that's completely factored. So I have x equal to 0 as a 0. And I also have x is equal to 12 fifths as a 0. How many times is this a 0? Well, this is a triple. So what's, what is it going to do? Well, it's going to cross through the x-axis. It's going to cross through the x-axis uh, at 0 because I have... Uh, triple zero and so at zero here I'm gonna have a zero and at 12 fifths which is just a little bit over 2 12 fifths I'm gonna have another zero since that's a single that's gonna pass through as well fourth degree polynomial what's my end behavior well I know I'm gonna be up I'm gonna be up so I'm gonna have to come down here and I can only pass through the axes at the zeros so I'm gonna come down here and since it's a triple it's going to flatten off and then I'm going to go through so I started up here all I could do is go through because it's a triple pass through it and then since this one's a single I got to pass through it did I match my end behavior yes I did is it a beautiful curve no it's not however you can go ahead and graph it with your calculator and check and make it very smooth now for part B if I have this I have f of x Go ahead and factor this. I take out an x. Well, this one isn't obvious to factor, but you know that you have an x. I'm going to take out a negative 2x. And I'm going to be left with x squared plus 3x minus 9 fourths. Why I did this is because it makes the inside nicer to factor. So this is negative 2x. x, factors of 9 fourths that get me there. Word on the street is that I'm terrible at these negative signs, but I fixed it. Okay, so then I go minus 3 halves, and then x minus 3 halves. So that works out. And so if I look at my zeros, I get x equal to 0. What's my multiplicity on that? Well, there isn't any, so it's just a singleton, so it's going to pass through. And then here, I'm going to have a double. So at x equal to 3 halves, I have a double. So what is that going to do? Well, I think that's going to bounce. And look at your end behavior. This is a cubic. And leading coefficient, negative. So is it going to go, or is it going to go, well, it's going to go the other way. So my end behavior is going to go this way. What happens inside? Well, I'm going to plot a 0, and I'm going to plot 3 halves, which would be right about there. So coming down through here, I'm going to pass through 0. I have to pass through 0, and then I'm going to bounce on this one right here. So I'm going to stay below in order to match up with this end behavior over here. So shoot through on this one since it's a single. I got to bounce off since that's one is a double and make sure that your end behavior matches up. If it doesn't, then you're in trouble. Uh, this video is getting a little long, so intermediate value theorem we'll probably talk about in class. But really all it is is that if I have one y value and another y value on a continuous function, then if I have a y value in between there, I'm guaranteed to cross that y value someplace. So, well, I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to talk about this real quick. So if I have some x values, negative 2, 0, 2, and this goes from negative 11 to 2 to negative 8. What do I know that happened inside there and inside there if this is a continuous function? Well, somewhere in there I must have passed over. Zero, yes, I must have a zero in there and a zero in there. Because to go from a negative 11 to 2 in its continuous function, I have to cross zero. That's the intermediate value theorem in a nutshell. You can look at that a little bit more thoroughly.
All right, this is a little long. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Section 3.1. Have a great day.